We're going to continue with the workshop agenda here this evening. Uh, the first thing that I have on the agenda for this evening is the first reading of revision to policy number 5200, which is the comprehensive student attendance policy. Uh, it continues to come up for a variety of reasons, um, and we continue to, to tweak this. Uh, and we will be looking for the second and final reading of this policy at next week's meeting. Anyone have any questions on this? Yes, Mr. Levinson. Just on, um, I don't know if it's nitpicking or not, but after C, the coaches and advisors um, will be responsible for monitoring student, atten uh, student attendance of the students. I, I think you say participate in their particular activity instead of the activities, <coughs> just the coaches and advisors should just, I would assume, just be concerned with their kids that are, that are under their. Uh, okay. On, uh, One, two, the back of the second page, it says C intervention procedures shall be utilized at all levels. And, yeah, and the first the one says coaches. And, they're responsible for their students on while they're the coach or the advisor. So how about students attendance of students participating in their There, just there.
that includes everything. Mine well, did not include subs. I wasn't aware that they required subs. I thought their means were on not during the school day. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. You can check it. I don't think they ever left for a meet. Their meets are on the weekends. I'll look at meets during the week because there were subs that they hired for the coach when there was meets during the week. There were meets during the week. Because half day, half day subs were hired or something. Yeah, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll revise their But regardless, they have all the money that they paid for. Yeah, there's enough in the refund that would cover any sub expenses. <coughs> We couldn't, you know, I mean, that was clearly stipulated. It was going to cost the district nothing. So we would not have expended any money as a district for this team or their needs. Any other questions on this? Okay. Well, the items that I have this evening, the next items on the agenda are from the superintendent. Thank you, Madam President. This evening, we are recognizing one of our very special staff members who recently played an important role in helping save the life of one of our students. As you remember, about two months ago, we recognized another staff member for a similar <coughs> event occurred. And this speaks to the preparation and readiness to action of the people to whom we entrust our children. I would like to ask Mr. Michael Raguso, South Middle School principal, to join us at the podium and share a little bit about Ms. Rachel Schuyler's fortunate intervention. Mr. Raguso. Good evening, thank you very much. Um, Madam President, board members, Superintendent Pizzo, and Central Administrators, um, I'm Mike Raguse, I'm the principal of South Middle School, and tonight I'm here, and I thank you for inviting us to recognize one of our assistant principals who on April 25th, 2013, saved the life of one of our students. Um, Mrs. Schuyler was doing what she does every day, and she was uh, supervising our students in the lunchroom, and upon dismissal, as the students were exiting the lunchroom, she noticed that a child was indicating the universal sign for choking. So Mrs. Schuyler reacted very, very quickly and calmly, um, ran over to the young lady, her name is Gia, and she began to perform the Heimlich maneuver, thrusting Gia several times and dislodging an orange that Gia was eating. Um, it was brought to my attention, and it's one of those things where you have a delayed reaction. And so I spoke to Rachel and I, I said, what happened? And she explained, um, really downplaying it. And so I went to the, the video and I took a look at it and I was just awestruck that Rachel could respond and react in such a calm manner um, in a life and death situation and prevail. So tonight we recognize Rachel Schuyler for this act of, this incredible act of heroism. So thank you very much.
Mr. Schuyler for your time and action. We commend you for it. And thank you, Mr. LaRusso. Next, we have an excellent and teaching award. It's another special recognition for Mr. Gregory Carlson, who is recognized by SUNY New Paul School of Education. We have presented him with the Award for Excellence in Teaching. Mr. Carlson has been nominated by Guinea Avenue School Principal Linda LaMarche, who recognized all the contributions Mr. Carlson has made to the school and the district over the years. I'd like to ask Mrs. LaMarche to share with us a little about this honor and what, is, what it has meant to our honoree. Thank you, Mr. Pizzo, um, President, um, Board President, Ms. Buchak, members of the board, uh, and central administration. Mr. Carlson has been a science teacher at GAMS for as long as I've been there, and he's the Bill Nye of Gidney Avenue. He's instilled a love of learning and science, not only in our students, but in our teachers as well, uh, and is a wonderful uh, role model for everyone. He's been doing hands-on, small group, experiential learning um, for as long as it's been around. And uh, we, we are very happy that he was able to receive this award. Uh, I know it's meant a lot to him. He's very humble and uh, takes it all in a day's work. But uh, he's something special and we're very happy to have him and one of a kind museum that he runs in our school. So thank you, Mr. Carlson. Evening, we're also recognizing two of our students who recently were designated as delegate and alternate delegate to the Puerto Rican Youth Leadership Institute that annually takes place in Albany. The selection process involves an application and interviews as well as the preparatory activities prior to the trip to Albany. Congratulations to Richard Zunio and Charlene Lima and their parents for their achievement. I'd like to ask Mrs. Bertha Hurtado, a school counselor at Newburgh Creek Academy, to join us at the podium and share a little with us about what they accomplished. It is great pleasure to be here tonight to recognize two extraordinary and very deserving Newburgh Creek Academy students for being selected to participate in the Agile Del Toro Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute. The Institute was founded by the late Assemblyman Angelo Del Toro in 1990. The purpose of PILA is to empower Latino students by fostering leadership skills and introducing them to the New York State legislative process. Twelve delegations state statewide participate in PILA. The Manhattan delegation alone has 22 participating school districts within five counties. Typically six students attend a series of trainings until the last 12 students are selected as delegates. This year was a little different. Delegates were chosen right away. Our students joined the rest of the Mid-Hudson delegation in attending two conferences to research local issues and debate current proposed bills. They attended a week weekend-long forum in our capital. Here they hold mock assembly sessions conducted in the New York State Assembly Chamber. Both students did an extraordinary job throughout the entire process and deserve praise for their efforts. The first student I would like to present to you is one of our current juniors. She has a long resume of activities which includes helping the Catholic community in charities, events, and fundraisers. 
She's part of the youth arts group where she advocates for social justice, including advocating for farm workers' rights with the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights in the Rural Migrant Ministry. I am very proud to present to you Ms. Charlene Lima. Uh, 
Um, I'll just briefly go over um, the procedures that were conducted and um, the results and any recommendations that we had. Um, first, I'd like to start uh, for the reason why the procedures were done. Um, the school of this a school of this size is required to have a annual risk assessment. And we performed that, and then as a result of that, the school picks an area to do some focused testing on. What was decided, the area that was decided to test was um, in the payroll area, and it was then further decided to do the payroll distribution area. In conducting this, we reviewed the policies and procedures, and with a lot of help from uh, Mike and Mary Ellen, uh, it was definitely a team effort and we couldn't have done it without, without everybody's help and a team effort in organizing this um, and making it happen. The payroll distribution, what happens is um, in order to receive a paycheck uh, for that, for this period of time, the individual needed to uh, show two forms of ID. If, um, if you didn't have two forms of ID, you weren't uh, able to uh, receive your paycheck. Um, an exception to some of these items, or to the payroll distribution, is if there were any individuals that were on um, any medical leave, uh, maternity leave, if they were out sick, if they were on scheduled vacation, a list was provided to us, and those checks were mailed to those individuals. We went to all, the first day, which it occurred on November 21st, we went to all 16 locations. And the uh, administrators there also um, participated and helped us out as well. So we conducted the payroll distribution in the morning. At the end of that time period, um, whoever didn't show up, to receive their paycheck. We reconciled those to the list and they were all brought back up to um, the district office. Later that day, we conducted a, another opportunity for the individuals to come actually to here to this room to um, show their ID and receive their um, pay, paycheck. At the end of that day, again, it was reconciled with checks remained and what we had on the list. And the, we conducted a, another day, um, the following Monday on the 26th, another opportunity for individuals to show up and to uh, receive their paycheck. After this day, again, another reconciliation was um, performed. We also verified for any um, anyone that was on the list for medical leave or vacation, we verified that with um, the HR records to make sure that that coincided. At the at this point, all of the unclaimed paychecks were then um, handed over to the district office, and the district office then took responsibility for the remainder of the checks and the distribution. Phone calls were made to the individuals to remind them that they needed to come down with the proper ID. The, um, I do want to mention the ID that was required was one form had to be a photo ID and one form of uh, another I type of ID. It didn't have to be a photo ID. If, um, if they were required to have a school ID, they, they had to have that school ID. <laughs> the, currently, the substitutes are not required to have a school ID, so um, they showed up with a kind of form of ID. The, the result of giving a period of time um, for the remaining of the checks to be distributed as of January, um, there was only one check that was not distributed, and this was just um, one one individual, and it was, I believe, only for one day worth of substituting, and the person actually had been out of town. Um, I believe um, they were helping uh, with family matters. So you still have that check. Okay, you still have that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I think that out of the numerous checks that were distributed that this actually um, went very well. There was one other item that was 
was noted, and it was an individual that did not claim a check. Um, and with further investigation that was followed up on the um, district office, it was discovered that this person was receiving a payment that they really it was on, it was an unwarranted payment. What happened with this situation is the person resigned, and it was at the end of June of 2012. During this period of, um, at the end of June of 2012, when the person resigned, in order to, um, and I'm gonna uh, ask Mr. Purcell to, um, uh, to add anything as, as I'm uh, going. Um, the, pay, the payroll, in order to get ready for the payroll, for the next payroll, which occurred in July, the, um, the system was rolled over, we'll, we'll say. So it was kind of, um, that was rolled over, and then the resignation of the individual happened. So in order to, to do the payroll, the first payroll of July, the system was rolled over. But then the resignation came in in June. So there was a little um, conflict there. So when September payroll started again, this person actually was still on the payroll and was receiving payments. Uh, I think there was three payments that were received. Three. Right. And um, when this was discovered, um, the, the person was contacted. Uh, legal legal advice was um, assaulted. And also, um, the district office um, also contacted, contacted QuinCAP, which is the uh, system that is used, to find out how this could be corrected and to be prevented um, for the future. And I believe that's been done and that's been corrected. Yeah, let me just uh, add on and help you out here. When we do the rollover to, as Terry Ann had, had mentioned, to start for that July, I think it was July 5th was the first paycheck, we roll over sometime uh, between now and the end of ah. June to get ready for that. This person resigned probably the last couple days of June. So she was dropped from, the, the, her resignation date was put into the current cal the calendar year that she resigned in 2012. And when WinCap, WinCap had already rolled over for the 2013, the 12-13 start year, once they roll over, it doesn't have a look back function. So now when you terminate someone and the current year is set up to be rolled over, WinCap put the feature in that prompts a window that says that you're terminating in the current year, do you want to also allow for this in the next year? And they do that also for budgeting. When I set up a new budget account in this, in this school year, if I set one up today, it will ask me now, do I want to carry forward with all the balances into the 12-13 or 13-14 school year going forward? So they've actually added that feature because that didn't have the look back period once it started. So I don't know, it, it, it doesn't excuse what happened, but it's the explanation of what happened. So as a result of this um, payroll distribution, we did have a few recommendations. Um, one of them being when we were reviewing the IDs, we noticed that some of the school IDs were not current. So we do encourage that the um, that the district kind of put something up there for to get current IDs for everybody. We also um, would suggest that the board possibly consider uh, photo IDs for the substitutes. I know there is some reasons back and forth for not doing that, but um, based upon our payroll observation and distribution, we would um, present to the board to maybe consider that IDs for the uh, substitutes. <coughs> and um, because of the high level of um, segregation of duties with um, HR being separated from the payroll, um, which th this is a good thing, but we would um, also suggest that with the payroll, that um, an experienced and educated person from the HR side review these payments, and that would would have possibly been another way to have um, caught or you know found, discovered that this this payment was happening. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, the other, this, this payment would have eventually got, gotten caught uh, regardless after the fact because at the end of the year, the WinPAP system runs an edit report with the active live employees report. Uh, I understand what's being said. Um, we can certainly look into that, but there is a, a checks and balance that's done by computer towards the end of the year, too. So our recommendation would be on a periodic basis. Um, this would have occurred at the at year end uh, for so it would have been caught a few months later. Right, but right. we'd encourage it maybe to consider adding that procedure, new procedure sooner. There were maybe several times you know during the year so right. that it would you know it would be picked up sooner because although the safeguard is there, it would have been a whole year gone by right. that it would have been occurring. Right. And you know, this we really do believe that this is you know really an isolated incident where you're not. It's not going to happen very often where someone's going to resign the last few days of June and you're going to have that rollover period. So, but it is you know we are aware of it. It's been corrected. We we have a you know solution within the system. So, um, I believe uh, that's it. And we'd like to thank you. I'm going to ask you to stay up there for a few minutes okay. so the board members have a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Prokash. Uh, I'm, I'm just a little confused. Is this, was this a full-time employee? Yes. Yes. All right. So it was a full-time employee that resigned in, in June and then got three paychecks after that? Was it, a, a, was, it, was it somebody that was working over the summer? No, starting in September. Starting in September. So they got a September 15 check. And was it sent to a school? Yeah, the, the process is we send all the checks out to wherever the employee designates right. their site to be, it goes out to the school, and the checks that are not picked up, um, to avoid the delay of the, the person getting the checks, the, and the school district takes a copy of the checks and sends it off, uh, puts it in the mail, and it gets sent out directly from the school. We retain copies of what was sent out. Can I ask, is this a teacher? No. Yeah. So it was somebody that was supposed to be working full time. It was a full month, a ten month employee. Right. But full time. I, I still don't understand how to go three checks without getting picked up. Well, because if they don't pick it up on Friday, the school mails it out on Monday. It gets mailed. It gets mailed to their. But home. somebody along the line, if somebody's not there, somebody's not there. Three checks in a row. I mean, we can blame it on Lincap or something, but that's human error in here. Well, that, there's a lot of people Along, that choose. That, all the way down the line. There's a lot of people in the district that choose to not pick their check up on Friday and have it mailed. Maybe it's because of their timing of when they actually have to work that day and pick up the checks. So, so that does happen. Mr. Levenstein. Okay. Um, Ms. Real, first of all, you did, you did a very thorough job. And a couple of questions I have. Um, firstly, Basically, you were done with your report January 7th or January 8th? Uh, yes. Okay, so at that point, you turned over 96 checks to the to the uh, Actually, the checks were turned over on November 26th. Okay, so November 26th, was it, was it 96 checks plus the one check, or was that one check never given to you? Because it was one check withheld from Vanacore. Oh. There, there was one item on the day of distribution, which was um, November 21st, that um, was not present at NFA North. Um, the superintendent had that. Okay, so there's one check that the superintendent held, and yes. it was 96 turned over. Then you were out of the process, and your firm was out of the process then. Yes. And then it was the district clerk, is that who handled checking IDs and whether it was the right person or not? And I had had them. And have them signed. So, so the audit. I mean, did I don't know how many checks did you hand out over the those three time periods? Oh, I forget the number now. I don't okay, know. So, but it was still ninety six that we don't have an accounting for. What the reason that they weren't picked up and that they were picked up? A lot downtown. of them are substitutes right. that aren't here on a regular basis. The bulk of them were subs. Yes. Okay. That were either working somewhere else at the time and just assume that they were going to get it mailed to them. So we had to reach, keep reaching out to contact them. Okay, so the, the one check held by the superintendent, was that the check for the employee that was unwarranted? That was due to litigation that was occurring yeah. at the time. 
But so it, it's not with that one first, it's not with the one check. That's a different That's correct. That's a different check. Right. Okay. So I, I'm just trying to get a handle on, on this. So 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 all the all the checks were um, delivered on to each of the sixteen locations. <laughs> yeah, what, and so I'm, one of the when we, we reconciled and we said, Oh wait, this check isn't here. I, I Why was, isn't here? I'm concerned about the ninety six okay. and the two other additional ones. That's more of my concern. The rest, I know you guys did a great job, and I know you make sure that the people who maybe had some unhappy employees that have to show things, but I, I understand. I have to say, overall, they, it went really well. Right. There was not right. a lot of complaining, you know. It, it really, we were pleasantly surprised. All right, so, so Mr. Sullivan, have we gotten money back from that person? I assume we asked for money. We did ask for money. Um, we had a letter written by the attorneys that was uh, sent to her and hand delivered to her. Mm -hmm. um, there's been no response. Ms. Shaw and I have been working on getting it into small claims court because the amount of money owed to the district is a small claims that matter.
our work for the most part is in the main office area with window replacements, but there will be some coordination and whatever needs to be done for assistance there will be provided. The um, closeout report that I provided is a kind of a consolidation of the um, reports you've been getting updates on as we've gone through the last number of months. Uh, what this report concludes, there are 118 contracts that are associated with these 39 projects. 30 of the projects are closed out. Uh, approximately 100 of the contracts are closed out. And those that remain are the work that's underway at the Ave and the work that was done this past summer. So we are zeroing in on everything wrapped up. You'll notice in the report our goal is to have uh, all the project closeout documents received and final payments issued by August. And that will assist us and allow us to start doing some of the final cost reports that won't be due until next June. But we'll be able to get a head start on some of that work as well. That's kind of a quick overview of our update for this month, Mr. Pizzo. Questions? Okay. Mr. Whitall? Yes, Jay. I just got a spelling error. I know on the uh, Downstate Elementary School, it's got VAI. Yes. It's modern technology. I'll take care of that. Yeah, I figured you'd want to take that. care of that. I did uh, miss one item. There's also in your update, there was a uh, proposal and a draft resolution for the uh, um, ex expanded construction administration services for new architecture. Uh, this is similar to the work that was done last summer. Um, this is to provide those services that had typically been provided by a construction manager. This is their work for preparation of contracts, um, conducting the uh, project meetings, preparing the meeting minutes, and overseeing the work at a greater level than they would as just the design professional. Yes, Mr. Prokop, you just vote on, um, um, recently on that was for the vestibule work, right. for the three, um, for the wide series proposition. Because this has nothing to do with the vestibule. Why is this $20,000 for what? This is for their oversight. Their proposal is, is included in a list of the services and the hours that are going to be provided. This They're is already the there, right? They're already on the job. They are getting ready to get started this summer. They've started the work. They've prepared the contracts for the contractor. This really kicks off when the work starts once the students are done at the end of the week. This is to oversee the summer construction. This is similar to what was done last year with the three architects for the work that was done last summer. This is, um, we reduced the scope of these services a little bit by about 25% from what was done last year. It's a single site, it's a smaller contract. We're working with a general contractor and a window subcontractor that we've worked with in the past, so we took that into account. And we're also going to provide some additional oversight with Andy and myself. Mr. Levenstein. Uh, on the same thing, I, I was just looking at the, the 19000 there, and I was trying to figure out what, what the construction cost. That's professional services. Is it 67000 for the project? I don't, I don't know if that's fair. That's and 198 for the professional services? Or is it, is it that money for the architect, is it for a larger sum of construction dollars? It's for the entire contract. That would be, if you look at the change order resolution that's included, mm -hmm. the current... Um, so the change is 67,000? The change is 67,000. That increases the general contractor's contract to Four hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars. But we had a contract with him when it was three ninety-nine. Correct? correct. And then so it, the contract increased sixty-seven thousand. Correct to include and, the abatement. Okay. Correct. And the professional services for that sixty-seven thousand increased nineteen thousand. No, it's for the entire contract. The we didn't in that three ninety-nine. We did. He had submitted his proposal for his um, oh, construction okay. so administration. The, so so his, his proposal is based on duration, not the value of the work. I, I understand, but I just want to know what we're spending, what percentage we're spending on professional services versus what the project costs. That's what. That's what I was trying to find out, and, and I saw the 
increase of 67,000, and I see an increase of an architecture of 198. So that's what I put together. Maybe I was incorrect. But that's what I put together to say we're paying almost 25% of the cost of the budget for professional services. Is that I understand the question. It is confusing. The one's a change order resolution that increases the general contractor's contract. The other is the oversight for the entire contract based upon the duration, not the cost. Is pro that sixty-seven thousand is actually not written. In te technically, it's a um, a um, what do you call it? A change, change order. order, but it's really not a change order because isn't this sixty-seven thousand? Because the other no one bid. We had no bids. So it's actually a bid. We we're, you're calling it here a, 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 an extra, basically, but it really is not an extra because no one bid. For, that abatement. For contractual purposes. For contractual it's purposes. Change order. That's so it's exactly really not purpose. a change order, we it's had, a bid. That's correct. We had the general contract to solicit the pricing, and then the price that we received from, from him was significantly higher than that. So we went back and met with them, right. and that cost came down about $12,000. Right. But it was close to where our estimate was. But you're correct. It's for contractual purposes, we had to issue a change order. Right. But it's correct. really not a change order because yes. they. The services had to be done, and we didn't have any right, bids right, in on right. the services. We did go. There is a included in with that change order resolution. There's a note. I had um, Minuta contact the state education department to make sure that they would be um, okay with this work being awarded as a change order versus a prime contract. I read they had that. seen this in the past, and they were they were comfortable with that. I just don't understand the extra money for Minuta when we'd already have them on as to oversee. I, I still don't understand why it's twenty thousand dollars more. They don't provide any oversight in their normal contract. That's why this is expanded construction. I thought that's what we, we had them for instead of a construction person we do below you above them. When they were hired for the Foster Town project, yeah. the oversight work was not part of their contract. The only thing they were obligated to provide would be attendance at job meetings. And do so they haven't been out there this whole year? No, they would go, and they would do periodic site visits. Now they're responsible to put together the meeting agendas, do the meeting minutes, prepare the contract, prepare the change orders, visit the job sites. It's that expanded role that they're being paid the additional fees for. They're more than just the design professional doing what would be their typical construction administration service work. So that as a uh, owner rep, you have to then watch over them? Correct. More. Correct. Right. Okay. That's one of the reasons we've reduced their fee because we've worked with this set of contractors in the past and we thought that that would be appropriate to do that in that Because they wanted to put in more time for what correct, correct. which about a third made their fee percent. go up to put in more time for oversight and your point was that we had worked with this group of contractors before and it wasn't necessary to have that level of oversight and so they needed to come down on their price for um, you know for the administration. Good questions. Any other questions on this? Thank you Mr. Damon. Thank you Terry. Resolution B is to approve facilities change orders associated with approved projects. Those to town renovation. Questions or comments on that? Resolution C to amend agreement with the new architecture to provide expanded construction administration services to Foster. Thank you, Mr. Piso. Tonight, Buildings and Grounds represent a different request of different organizations that want to use our schools, their insurance, the dates for the schools are available. Uh, <coughs> in addition to that, I have one additional request that came today. I've been working with a yeah. movie company that will be uh, taping the movie in the city of Newburgh. They are interested in using LFA and South Middle School on July 18th and July 26th. I met with them last week. I will put this through the uh, school due tomorrow morning. They already know the charges. 
and I will be adding this to the agenda for the regular board meeting next week. Can I ask a question? Are they a commercial venture? Are they a for-profit corporation? I believe so. Then you should not be allowing the use. Oh. Okay. Is this the same outfit they called me up and wanted to use the board parking lot? What's the name of the people? No, this is a group that uh, did the movie as Stewart a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think that's the guy they called. Okay. I, I told them that uh, we couldn't do that because uh, we had people parking in the parking lot. Yeah. So they wanted to use our little parking lot. Right? Right next to the so this won't be a group. Also, there, uh, from my experience in reviewing these types of, types of agreements, they're quite um, onerous and very, very centered on them and not the school district. Okay. I can't remember, but they're paying you enough to purchase. That's fine. I'm sorry, we're here. Yeah. I think we should, we should look into it, not just say no or what. Yeah, I want to see the documents, and I would right. to see them. I mean, rather than just say blanket no. You know, if we're going to be making a little bit of money off of it, and maybe they can throw a little more bone or whatever. But I mean, just to say no, for the sake of saying that we have other, you know, uh, ventures come in that are profit, uh, in, you know, in the district that end up giving the district something. But, and Mr. So McAfee get, had asked um, at last month's Buildings and Grounds if we could incorporate um, like an internship type thing with our students um, because we have students that do that type of cinematography type work at NFA and um, they were open to that you know idea and I think that would be a great experience for our students. I will contact them in the morning to get all the paperwork and I will forward it to uh, Margo tomorrow and if it's okay with our offer then I'll bring it next week if not. Yes, Mrs. McAfee. Would that mean, Margo, that you would need any special um, agreement as far as the students working with them? Because that was going to happen at the NFA field, right? Yes, correct. Yes, there would have to be something incorporated to sort of police it. Ms. Resch. So, Margo, what specifically is your concern? Because I've had them at our place before, and their releases are usually pretty specific protecting the property and the ownership. I've seen a lot of these agreements, and most, and, and it is a commercial venture, and um, we have to make sure that, that we are protected in terms of the way our property is used and portrayed. So it's not so much the profit part. It's well, the, the profit part, part is a big thing because Facilities use request, and use of facilities shouldn't be for a commercial purpose. And they're making money from this. Even in these situations, well, we'd be making money too. <laughs> We're just like, we need the money, so. Right. Well, I would like to see what they're offering and what they have. And if it can be done legally, that's one thing, and if it's to your benefit. Otherwise, you know, I really need to see it. I'll make sure you get it in the morning. Any other questions on this, any of these items? I also had asked um, if Mr. Velez could just verify for the Orange County Parks Department. It said they didn't know whether they were charging a fee or not. Um, so I just wanted to, to verify that. And um, it could be that whatever they might collect would be so small that it's not even gonna cover their expenses, in which case it's not a big deal, but I'd just like to verify that information. I will contact them in the morning. Yes, yes Ms. Pearl. So, um, uh, Madam President, we were going to look into the hot again for the youth football. There, you know, it, it's come up again with the with the Goldbacks youth football, and um, they were asking about you know bringing something to cook on so they could do concessions and leaving it at the, you know, on the property, and Mr. Velez explained to them, you know, we can't assume that liability. So, you know, we're wondering what the deterrent is to renting out the hut. Uh, I don't, I haven't looked into the rental costs for the electric earning, but I certainly would have to inquire with Tim Dean, our insurance consultant, because with the hut you're dealing with uh, plain, uh, I think there's uh, a stove in there or some sort of cooking uh, 
apparatus, uh, I would have to discuss with them. And, and if an organization came in, like they have to have certain insurance, certificates of insurance um, to protect us. So would that be, Marta, would that be something that would be covered, you know, if they came in with, with whatever the millions of dollars of insurance is, is I'm just wondering if that's where the protection is. Well, that's, some, that's obviously some protection, but um, you never know what happens uh, when somebody is using fire. It's not just the individual doing it, it's the other people there. What if, what if there's a fire? Mm -hmm. So, Madam, um, Madam President, to a model, if someone comes in outside, organization, they come in with an umbrella policy of a million dollars, that doesn't relieve us of any responsibility if they're renting? That names you as an additional insured under their policy. You also have your own liability policy. Um, and it doesn't, it does, it may or may not cover. A million dollars is a lot of money, but not a lot of money when you're dealing with a catastrophe. So, you know, it's very important that we speak to Tim Dean and who is your insurance person. Thank you. Any other questions on any of the facilities use requests? Just one, yes. one last thing also. I would have to talk to the administration of the high school because I think they, they retain inventory in those huts also. So I would have to discuss with them um, the process. If, if Tim Dean does say it's okay and we be covered, and the board does wish to rent that out, I'd have to work out the semantics with the high school protect their current inventory from when they actually have the game.
We've had 48 incidents of out-of-school suspensions for students with disabilities. And I'd like to, uh, there's a correction needed on your summary form in that um, the information that we pulled from IEP Direct um, is not, um, is not a get, we're not gaining the information in our office to reflect those students going to the alternative to home teaching at 49 Grand Street. And so Mr. McElmore and I have worked and we've, re we've been able to identify that there are, we've had nine students with disabilities that have participated in that program as opposed to being put on home instruction for the time period of their suspension. I'd also like to share with you, I know there uh, have been questions in the past and I have some information um, with regard to the inconsistencies of the identification of evaluators. We've, uh, on the uh, Board of Education uh, summary of recommendations. Uh, we spoke with uh, the technical support personnel at IEP Direct um, to get to, to some, some more information. Evaluators' names are included in the drop-down menus uh, for all of our special education service personnel and related service providers. Um, there is inconsistencies in the record keeping of ensuring that each personnel is using the drop down menus and so that is that is a documentation and record keeping that we'll continue to work to correct. If there are specific questions about any of the students IEPs, I do have information um, about who evaluators were. And we went, I had my staff go into individual student records so that I could answer any questions for you. Questions? Yes, Mr. Levenstein. Okay, um, I have a couple on the evaluators. Um, firstly, and I don't, I guess this might be a, a normal situation. Some people are evaluators in some cases and CSEA chairs in other places. Is that something that is, is normal and not no kind of issues with that? I just noticed that on some. <coughs> well, it would depend if a meeting was a subcommittee meeting of the, of the Committee on Special Ed, in which case um, in the last, in the past several years, the school psychologists are the uh, subcommittee chair people. They may have in the past been the um, school psychologists that performed the educational assessment and so that that would be a possibility um, it is not a conflict in fact that the evaluator is at the meeting um, but there are but there should be rare instances where the CSE chairperson is also the evaluate is also I, I the see evaluator. The same for the same students yeah. right? for different students for different students we have at time depending on the role um, as you know we are um, we have many evaluations to be done and um, at times may require um, some of our staff that are also school psychologists or other related service personnel to conduct some of those evaluations as well as perhaps the, um, the educational evaluation to be done by any uh, person that is a special education teacher. Okay, I have one other thing in reference to evaluators. If you look at page 14 on the school age students, um, I I'm, think this, this was a transfer student who came in yes. in June. Mm -hmm. And if you look, every, every evaluator is listed there. So was that done by another school, all that information? Because the dates are prior to them coming to Newburgh. Mm -hmm. So is, is, that, is that student's, this student's history of record, that listing is from another school district? I will look into this student in particular. We have many transfer students that leave the district and come back to the district, and when we have a prior IEP, the, that information is repopulated. But I'm, I well, look the, into this. The reason is, is because there's a lot of evaluators and they're all listed, which yes. is unusual for, for our right. uh, um, seen before. Right. Okay. And then the only other question, a general question, is on um, looking at students who are classified. Now, from, from what I can get out of this chart, uh, school-age children that have been classified since September is 218. Um, and then number of uh, students 
with disabilities transferring in is 129. So that's, three, according to what I can make out of it, it's 347 students, newly classified students into the district, uh, only one declassified, and our total on the next page only goes up by 11 from September to June. So, so my question really is that's 335 students who um, are not listed as classified. So where did they go? Um, or what reason did they come out? Did they all drop out? Or, or what did they all leave the district? Is there any data on that for that uh, um, you know, 10 months, nine months for 335 students? Yeah. Um, so I, what's not reflected in this chart, and certainly um, moving forward from July 1, we can include um, a monthly report of the students that exit um, our special education programs and services. Um, we are required to report on a, month, on a yearly basis to the State Education Department through the PD8 uh, report of all students that exit um, special education. I can tell you for the school year to date, um, we have, we have uh, IEP direct, through IEP Direct, um, we have a reporting of 222 students that have exited our district uh, in special education. Two of, the, for two of those students, um, for two of those students, the parents had uh, revoked their consent for services, so those two students actually still um, are enrolled um, and would be receiving uh, receiving education as a general education student. Uh, one student, as you know, is declassified. We've had three students with disabilities that have that are that have been deceased through this year. Um, we have 37 students with disabilities that dropped out of school. We have one student that received an IEP diploma in August. We have uh, eight students that received a Regents or a local diploma at the conclusion of August. We have some of these are good things. Yes. Yes. Okay. They're not all bad. Things. Uh, we have this uh, speaks to um, the transiency in and out of district. We've had 161 of our students that have moved, uh, have left the district due to um, moving to a new school district and they are known to continue. So that means that we had received a record request from the receiving school district and those uh, students are accounted for. Um, we've had two students who were preschool students that were declassified at, at transition. Um, we have another five students uh, coming into the school year that were declassified. And we have two additional students that received a Regents diploma at the conclusion of, of summer. So if it's helpful to you as a board, uh, we can certainly, uh, from the special education department, begin to report out um, uh, that information as well on a monthly basis. Well, I, mean, I, I don't need it on a monthly basis. This gives me an idea of, of the direction that mm -hmm. it is. Um, it, it's, I don't like the 37 that dropped out, but mm -hmm. if people move to another area, that's fine. Uh, people are getting the diploma, that, that's, that's the best thing to come out of the system. So. And it's still off 100 or so from this figure, so some figures may be to find out what's, what's going on. So I asked my staff to just pull the report from IEP Direct. What we really need to do is compare that to what we know through Infinite Campus, and we'll probably find um, any discrepancies in what we just did there. And I can certainly do that for you. Thank you. Other questions or comments on this? Yes, Mrs. McAbee. You mentioned several declassifications that don't show, and that would make me very, very happy. So, you know, uh, let, let's, let, let's try to find a way to, to include those in the future, because I think you, you mentioned three more. Uh, Ms. McAbee, those would be the ones I've seen as the uh, recommendations for the 13-14 school year IEPs. So, oh, yes, they are that. coming. Yes. Oh, oh, these are God. still excited. I know. <laughs> these are still the recommendations for uh, to carry us through the conclusion of 2012-2013. Uh, yeah. There she are many recommendations. I'm going to be very happy this coming year. Yeah. There are a few. Not as many as I'd like to see, but there are a few. Okay. 
Okay. Any other questions? on the agendas from the Executive Director for Curriculum and Instruction. Madam President, I'll be uh, filling in for Dr. Shanahan this evening. Uh, we have one resolution for your consideration. Uh, it's the resolution for the articulation agreement with the lot at Fishville um, for the nurse aid training program students during the 2013-2014 school year. And they had a record number this year at their pinning ceremony and anyone that hasn't had the opportunity to attend, I encourage you next year to go uh, and see these students that have successfully received their certification as certified nursing assistants aides and um, it's just wonderful to see the interaction with the students, with the um, people that are at the facility for Elant and it's really, really quite heartwarming. And um, the parents are so proud of their students and what they've accomplished. And so many of them are going on either to further their education in the healthcare field or to actually start employment at Elant. So um, if any of you can attend next year, um, I encourage it. It's the, the invitation we get for the annual pinning ceremony. And it's, it's really quite an experience. The next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Business. Thank you, Madam President. First item is a resolution to authorize the awarding of school lunch bids. Uh, number 13-14 is for the groceries and the cafeteria. Uh, bid number 13 through 15 are the meat and frozen meals for the ca cafe. Bid 13 through 16, which are the bread, French bread and rolls for the cafeteria, and bid number 13-17 uh, is the milk for the cafeteria. Questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Bids 1 through 9, okay? There's two vendors that, that put bids in. Bids one through nine, I, okay. the first company bid on only one through nine, okay? And the other company didn't. So the first company got all the bids that were awarded. Bid 10 through, 10 through 26, the second company bid on, the first wait, wait, company. Where are you? Okay, bread, I'm sorry, the bread uh, contract? We had two bidders. I'm sorry, uh, 1360. So, so uh, company number one bid on only one items one through nine, and they were the only one that bid on one through nine, and they got all the bids that were awarded. The second company bid on 10 through 26, and the first company didn't bid at all on those. So it was really only one bidder on both, and they won all the uh, bids that were awarded. So it's it's doesn't look good, I don't know, it may be a great deal for us, and we may be getting a good buy, but it, it seems, seems odd that, you know, you see what I'm looking at. Are you right? asking why there's not more bid? Uh, no, I'm just saying it seems odd. That's all I'm saying. That there's, there's, there's two, two bidders, bidders like they and they kind of split things in half. They drew a line, and, and that was it. I'm not saying that's the case. I, yeah, I, it just seems a little, it seems seconds. very odd. More than a little odd. I'm getting some information that the transportation bids, the bus companies do the same thing. Well, so I don't think that's not really, it's, it's not as bad as that. I see it's not as obvious. It's not as obvious. That is it's no bid. On, on some of the others, the bids are three times the price. Right. Okay, so that could be hidden a little because three times the price. But this, there was no bid from one, one company on half the items. No bids on the other company on the other one. Okay. Just, just, just say it. Out of curiosity. 
Yes, he is. He's going to ask a question. Still. I don't know what the price of bread is, so you're going to have to ask. No, no, no. That's not <laughs> you say it's a little odd, so what do you think we should do about that? You know what? Firstly, I don't know. Neither do I. I, I don't know, but I, I don't know if I would want to award bids based on this, or you know, create awards based on a single bid. Oh. Ms. Prokash, did we just award $67,000 for an abatement because there was no bids at all? <laughs> so someone just sort of as an extra. I mean, there was no bids. <laughs> Nobody bid it. It's the same thing. I mean, bread, the bacon, whatever. <laughs> we don't have any control. I'm not sure how we can encourage pe more people to bid, and I'm not sure how we can encourage there to be no conversations same, between vendors right. out there. Same I, I to say that. Sixty-seven thousand. Same. Same. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I could address the sixty-seven thousand with summation of, of from my own mind is that the job was too small for somebody to come in and set up and go through an abatement project. But because we had people on site, they decided that it was a lot easier for them to do it than somebody coming cold. So yeah, but conversely, uh, Mr. Pizzo, we could have it like Southside come in and give a $133,000 bid and then have all the extras and end up being a, a $300,000 job on abatement. So, well, that's, you know. well, that's, that's stuff that you find as you go along. You know, right. abatement is, is uh, it, it's like touch and go with it. You don't think they're going to find more than 67,000 out there? I don't know. I'm hoping not. Because they, they were asking a lot more than that. They're stuck with bread. <laughs> you say it's bread. You know, I'm bread. From which company? Which company? They wanted more than that. We, we got them down. I say we. The district's uh, representative got them down $12,000. So that was the savings. Uh, I don't think you mentioned that tonight. But that's, that's what we went over this morning. And... Uh, with the bread, as you brought up, so the uh, it, it goes on with snow bit bidding, yeah. uh, and that's the only way we get our work done because somebody these guys are out there taking care of each other. And, so what do you do about it? I mean, tell me how you get around that. We we'll probably end up costing us more money if we did. So I mean, we can talk about it. It's interesting discussion. But think about the snow plowing and how they split that up. Think about the bus routes, how they split that up. As we just mentioned. Well, what you're saying is they all they all have to stay in business, right. otherwise they've got a big problem. Yeah, so they're all sharing the wealth. Right. So I mean that's these the, big ones just don't want to be bothered. Like, that's the capital, yeah, that, 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 but that's the capitalistic system that we live in. That people take care of each other. Now that's been going on for I don't know how many years been running buses in the Newburgh. I think I've been around for most of them. But uh, that's that's how people survive. Those people are all paying taxes. So are these people, at least. <coughs> you know, it's local. I'm just declared that somebody local. Well, that, I am too, but that, I mean, that's what I look for here. This, this is somebody that uh, I'm glad we're taking care of. They, they work here, they got their business here, they hire people here, they spend their money here, and they pay taxes. This rush. Right? Yeah, you know me. Keep the love, love. I don't like change. I don't like change. So, it, it makes for an interesting discussion, but I, I think we're kind of helpless. This is the system that we have to survive. Uh, short Next, Mr. Uh, item B is a resolution to declare student desks obsolete and authorize the disposition of the same. C is a resolution to authorize payment of property tax refunds pursuant to court orders. Um, the first one is for Continental Manor Homeowners Association. <coughs> Another one for the Victor Rendano Associates. Another one for J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Bank. Well. I also want to just 
mentioned, this is not on here, but coming down probably in July or August, we just served with the court order for Central Hudson's reduction, which is going to amount to almost a million dollars. What? It dates back, I believe it's 2002. So there's a lot of calculations and interest that we have to go through in gyrations. So we just received this uh, this past week. It's not ready to come to you yet, but if I want to just give you the heads up, it's going to be almost a million dollars. The tax reserve can handle that one, but it is getting very, very low. Uh, Governor Cuomo, how we're not going to go insolvent. Well, I think, he says that's I think if you do run into the great governor, the, the question should be how can you go back 11 years and force the current tax base to cover what occurred in good faith and assessment 11 years ago right. with interest that no one can invest at that rate. Right. So if you do run into him, run, ask, run that question by him. Really quick before he goes to the White House. Which is probably going to come for a new assessment, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Item D is a resolution to authorize the Superintendent of Schools to execute an agreement with the Newburgh Capital Group to lease space at the Newburgh Mall for the Newburgh Free Library. Uh, this was budgeted for under the library, and it was discussed, and uh, we are experiencing uh, some positive reaction. And item E is a resolution to accept the bills and reports.
resolution I is to rescind and approve a revised abolish rate resolution. Just want to take a minute to go over that and explain what this is. Um, at the May meeting, you um, had a resolution before you to lay off pedagogical employees. Um, during the process of meeting with those employees, it was brought to the district's attention that one of the teachers in the music tenure area, we had made a mistake in her seniority. She had previously worked for the district, um, and I had no idea that she had worked for the district, so that affected her seniority. So, um, if you go down, that's the music change. If you go down to the second part of the resolution, you'll see that there are different names of individuals being laid off. It reflects the person I removed because of the seniority mistake and the new person being added that takes that place. <clears throat> and then for physical education, um, we um, originally had one retiree and 1.9 layoffs. We realized that there was a resignation we could use instead of laying off. So the correction is one retiree, one resignation, and a point not laid off. So that saved somebody's from being laid off. So we're asking your consideration to um, accept the revised focus. Mrs. Langer, do you think there'll be any other changes between now and Tuesday? Because I know this is an ever-evolving um, I believe you, there will be an additional resolution on Tuesday's agenda besides this one, which calls for additional layoffs. So unless I get retirements or resignations between now and then, there will at least be one additional uh, layoff. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> resolution J is to approve the revised job descriptions for the positions listed. Um, the major changes in the job descriptions were for these positions, we added as part of the qualifications that the individuals holding these positions must take the Danielson TeachScape course to be a certified observer under the APPR. So that was added um, as a qualification. Um, there was all, some of these were um, kind of old, so they had a mention of the older certifications that were once required. Um, some of us still have those old certifications, but um, those coming, new, newer people coming into the ranks have differently named certifications, so the, the job descriptions use those uh, new certification names. Yes, Mrs. McAfee. I'd like to request that, that uh, Jay just simply be withdrawn. Um, Mr. Forgen and I have been in conversation uh, about perhaps some continued work uh, that he would like to do on these to try to bring them into line with one another. And uh, he wants to revise some of the duties. Mr. Forgen. I'd like to clarify that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was brought to my attention by Mrs. McAfee that she had would like for me to review the qualifications um, to make sure that they, they are aligned and that they're tiered and that it, it's sequential across when we look at an elementary principal, a middle level principal, the specific areas of qualification. Um, as recommended by Mrs. McAfee, I would be more than happy to work with Ms. Limer to address that. Does that mean between <laughs> now and Tuesday? Yeah, he said over the summer is what he told me. <laughs> That's exactly what That's I said. That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, that presents a question that this will not be done Tuesday night. That's why I didn't know what the proper term was. I asked it to just be withdrawn you know, for now until it can be. Um, you know. I, I don't think it's going to impact anything between now and. Yeah, these, these are currently employed, right? This is yes. Okay. I just wanted to get a time frame. I am a superintendent of school. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Levenstein? Um, the other, other thing I noticed on the, the vice principal um, listing the north end, so is, is the plan that 
that that person would probably be majority on the north campus because it lists all the responsibilities and duties and it kind of has a lot for north. No, it shouldn't specify north. It should be a generic vice principal job description. So we would have to make those corrections. Okay. Okay. Title, vice principal. Job responsibilities. Duties and responsibilities. Uh, oh, oh, oh. After all, it is one high school, Newburgh Free Academy. Uh, yeah.